treat people earlier. Minimize the toxicities, of course, but treat people earlier so they don't end up uh, with a fatal and, and a clinically not a major disease. So here's one example, just one example of where we think we can begin, and we're doing this now in this uh, Stand Up to Cancer grant for the next uh, three, four years, um, where we think we should be able to uh, identify high-risk individuals, monitor their molecular progression, and, and treat them um, so that their disease can be uh, managed early. So there's just one example of how we might be able to start thinking about what I would call a precision uh, prevention, a precision early detection uh, approach with interventions, with uh, early diagnosis, and with treatment. So what about genetics? Um, so this is a, a slide. I'm, everybody just take a look at it carefully because I'm going to ask you to like remember all of this list because it's a very important list and you should know it by heart. Um, this is prostate cancer, something that I work in. I just want to give you some sense about where we are with germline genetics. This is the other area, individuals who are at high risk because of something they've inherited and the fact that they have, um, there might be risk that's sufficiently high that we want to do something about that risk. And there are, so we'll start with prostate cancer, then we'll go on to hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And just give you the feel for what it might look like if you are one of those people that could be at high risk and how we might want to think about preventing your disease or in whom we should be preventing disease. So GWAS um, to date have identified quite a few loci associated with prostate cancer. I have 167, I think it could be more depending on who you ask. Um, about 32% of familial relative risk is explained by the genes that have been identified so far by GMOS. So not the majority, but the, a substantial proportion. And if you look really carefully and you see the ones that I've marked in red, those are cancer genes. You know, MYC, TERT, um, CYP17A1, androgen receptor. These are genes that aren't a surprise that they're involved in prostate cancer because they work in pathways that we must have something to do with prostate, prostate carcinogenesis. There's a lot of other genes clearly that we don't know what they do, and they are um, uh, clearly associated uh, with risk. And so, what does this pattern look like? And I'm giving you the example for prostate cancer, but I think this is representative, more or less, of what we're finding in um, GWAS in general in commonly occurring cancers. So, first of all, less than 2% of the risk variants are in coding regions. Um, almost all of the variants that we've identified appear to involve regulation. Uh, regulatory effects of other proteins, other genes, other pathways, something like that. This is interesting uh, because uh, almost none of the, you know, the variants that we're finding change a protein, interrupt a gene. So if you think about what we were doing 20 years ago when we were trying to do candidate gene studies, we were looking for protein coding changes. We were looking for mutations that changed an amino acid in a protein, and that's just not what we're finding now. So, not that that's the only reason, but that might be one of the reasons some of our early studies didn't do very well, because we were looking in the wrong place. We weren't looking for, didn't know how to look for regulatory effects, uh, which seems to be the majority of the effect uh, that we see in cancer susceptibility these days. There doesn't seem to be ev any evidence for departure from multiplicative effects or interactions with environments or exposures. Now, that's a provocative statement, because I know there are some. Certainly in the realm of pharmacogenetics, I think we have some good examples. But in general, um, so far, we haven't really found uh, a lot of gene environment interactions or multiplicative effects of these loci. So why is that? Well, one reason might be that we would need the uh, 17 million person case control study to have the power to see those kinds of effects, uh, which we don't. Um, so we're, one of the problems is maybe that we don't have the study design or the ana analytical approaches that we need to to see those. But at minimum, I think it's reasonable to say that any prominent interactions between genes and environments or genes and genes that would cause huge high-level uh, associations, uh, non-multiplicative, beyond-multiplicative kind of effects don't appear to be there. We're not seeing that. Um, and there's a good paper, uh, Rudolph in uh, IJE in 2018, that did this for breast cancer. Um, there's a few examples out there right now. We're really just not seeing very many gene-environment interactions. And again, this is different than what we expected to see uh, a few years ago where we thought gene environment interactions were really going to be a thing, that we were going to be able to find some individuals who had um, a susceptibility, and when they uh, had a bad lifestyle or ate something bad or smoked, their risk would just skyrocket. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Again, there might be reasons why that isn't the case. There are some counterexamples, of course. 
Um, but that's what we're sort of seeing at the moment. That's the general picture, I think, that's fair. And you can debate that with me afterwards if you don't like that conclusion. But the implication, though, is that um, cancer risk is caused by the effects of environments and polygenic susceptibility. And they're largely orthogonal to one another. You have polygenic susceptibility. You have environments. They add up or they multiply, however you want, you want to think about it. And that's the sort of the cause of common cancer risk. Um, and that also makes our life a little bit um, easier because we don't have to think about all these interactions. We can just think about the environmental modification of risk on, on the back, background of polygenic susceptibility. So it makes it a little bit easier for us, to, if that's true, to think about what the implications of um, genes and environments are on cancer risk. So this is mostly based on what I've seen in prostate cancer, but I think from reading the literature in other areas, it's largely true in other cancers too. So but what you can do, of course, these days, and this gets back to in whom should we intervene, uh, if we're thinking about high-risk individuals and thinking about applying strategies for uh, early detection and prevention, we can certainly create polygenic risk scores. Here's an example <coughs> from a couple of years ago, again, in prostate. 133 GWAS hits, a large sample size. And uh, they did a 65 and 133 SNP panel. Uh, the AUC in, uh, from between 65 and 133 SNPs went from 0 0.67 to 0 0.68. So maybe not a surprise because most of the information is captured in the highest um, uh, impact, the, the, the SNPs with the greatest uh, magnitude of effect. And as you add more and more, you're not really, you're capturing odds ratios of 1.02. So you're not adding a whole lot of information uh, for uh, discrimination or calibration. Um, but you create these um, polygenic risk scores, and let's, this is the uh, 133 SNP uh, polygenic risk score. You can find some people in the lowest range who are significantly protected of, from prostate cancer, and you can find some that are significantly higher than average risk compared to a reference group. And so there are some individuals in the top 5% of the risk distribution who have a relative risk uh, of four. Um, so that's big, that's a very large um, increase in an individual's prostate cancer risk based just on the polygenic risk score. There haven't been really sort of associations of the same thing with survival. This is just risk. Um, so outcomes is a little bit different in prostate cancer. But there is a distribution here. Um, what we haven't done is really try to figure out how this kind of information is going to impact on uh, in, a, in a population, uh, ability to lower cancer risk and apply interventions. And so this is um, FP101. Uh, as you know, the characteristics of a test of what I just described is really very dependent on the, sense of the prevalence um, in, the, in the population. So let's say we did have a, uh, a test, a genomic test, a polygenic test that had 90% 90 90 sensitivity and 90% uh, specificity. But if the prevalence is only about 10%, we still don't have a great positive predictive value. Again, FE 101, but I raise it just to say the implications, even though we have some numbers that look good and that we can say we can identify some very high risk individuals, applying this test in a population is not yet how we would apply this test, how we would use this information to say, this group of individuals should have their PSA earlier or more frequently or you know whatever, um, we're not there yet. And we need to think about that carefully if we want to apply this information in a way we actually uh, reduce uh, cancer burden, reduce cancer risk, et cetera. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is work from um, Sweden, this is the Stockholm model in prostate cancer, where they use multivariate prediction of uh, aggressive tumors, so aggressive prostate cancer. That's really what we care about, not the indolent prostate cancers that won't kill people, but the aggressive tumors that might kill people. And so this is what they've studied in a relatively large um, uh, sample size from Sweden in their cohorts. And this is just a, one way of presenting the data, but you can see they uh, when they start with PSA, add risk factors, add biomarkers, add SNPs, add clinical information, uh, you can increase the cumulative area under the curve to be 0.74, pretty good. Not super, but pretty good. But if you look at what the SNPs are giving you, this is a genetic score, a polygenic risk score of 232 SNPs. Mm -hmm. It increases, if you already know your risk factors and your biomarkers and your PSA, it really very incrementally uh, increases the area under the curve with 232 SNPs. So again, not to badmouth SNPs, but I, um, and, and, and to say that they're not useful, 
But I think what we're learning from a lot of the literature, this is true in prostate and other diseases, is that we, the addition of genotypes um, for predicting risk is not clearly uh, borne out as something that we're ready to put into populations or we're willing to put into uh, into a clinical or a public health setting where we can maybe say uh, who in the population really deserves special treatment, uh, special um, interventions, and uh, enhanced surveillance, whatever it might be. And again, plenty of exceptions to some of this, but at least in prostate and some of the other major cancers, this is kind of where we are. So still our ability to predict risk in some people is not really there yet so that we know in whom we should be doing this precision prevention yet, at least with respect to common cancers and common genetic variation. It is important for me to notice here that note here that it's really we need to um, equally apply <coughs> cancer prevention, um, uh, but only if we know that everybody is the same, right? So if some everybody's the same, then giving a cancer prevention strategy to everybody is fine. But mostly people aren't the same, right? And I think what I've just told you is that people with early mutations in a MGUS or myeloma setting or people with GWAS hits may not be the same as people without those elevated risks. And so we need to think about what the uh, uh, interventions the, uh, are, uh, the interceptions might be uh, to get equity and outcome versus the equality of the application. So this is the pre precision piece of this. Um, and uh, we also, <clears throat> want to make sure we uh, think about inclusion and diversity because as you know, when you try to put in some of these uh, factors into uh, uh, the, the population, the uh, novel you know, screening strategies, novel interventions, novel technologies often benefit some populations and not others. And so that's something to just keep in mind as an interlude um, of how we think about uh, applying uh, precision strategies. We can't forget about the fact that uh, we need to keep, um, we, we need to make them accessible. So let me just end by giving you the other example, the counterexample to the GWAS setting, and that is the high-risk genomic setting. So again, we're trying to think about how we prevent uh, cancer in individuals who are at extremely high risk um, of cancers. This is just an example of what it might look like. Um, I think there are a lot of examples that one could use, but I do work in brc one 2 so that's what I'll talk about. Um, so this is BRC1 and 2. This is the cumulative cancer risks to age 70 in BRC1 and BRCA2 for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So what you can see is the average uh, lifetime risk uh, for a BRC1 mutation carrier for breast cancer is about 57%, 49% for BRCA2, and for ovarian cancer about 40% lifetime risk in BRCA1 and about 18% in BRCA2. So this is a meta-analysis from about you know, 12 years ago now. There are plenty of variability. There's plenty of variability about what these estimates are. So you, you can use your own favorite um, lifetime risk model for whatever. But just to give the illustration, there's variation here. The other thing is that these uh, vertical lines represent the individual um, uh, uh, estimates from which these meta-analytical um, uh, averages were taken. So you can see, first of all, that it risk increases as you get older. No surprise. But the vertical lines suggest there's a huge amount of variability. The, the lines are very wide. That suggests that there are some people that are at lower risk and some people that are at much higher risk. So that even though a BRCA1 mutation carrier has a very high risk of uh, breast cancer and you want to intervene in that person, there are people who may be at much lower risk and some that may be at much higher risk. So even in this setting, uh, we need to start thinking about variation within the population who is at high risk and what we do about those people. The reason that BRC1 and 2 and hereditary breast ovarian cancer are great examples is because we have clinical protocols that can test people for these mutations. And when we test somebody positive, we can do something about their risk. We can intervene. We know that, that risk-reducing ophorectomy, remove, surgical removal of ovaries, um, has a huge impact on uh, more risk and mortality. Uh, in BRC1 and two mutation, mutation carriers. So here's just one example of data. Um, for ovarian cancer, which is very difficult to present, prevent otherwise, we know that if you have an uh, ophorectomy, a bilateral salpingo ophorectomy prior to developing any kind of cancer, the risk reduction is about 70%, and the mortality reduction is about 60%. So a couple of points, again, you have a mutation, you have genetic testing and counseling, and then you can act on uh, the, the presence of those mutations. That's what we need. 
We don't need just the genetic information, we need it to be actionable. We need to have something that we can do to lower an individual's risk, otherwise the point of a lot of this information is, is limited. The second thing to note is that we're not talking about 100% risk or mortality reductions. Some of these women who, um, uh, who have this uh, ophorectomy still develop uh, ovarian cancer or primary perineal cancer and they still die of it. So the intervention is imperfect uh, and we know that. So remember that the intervention is imperfect. But there's another side to this story and that is uh, this one. So what we know is that lifetime ovarian cancer risk is not 100% either. So if you look, these are the same plots I showed you before. This is ovarian cancer risk for BRCA1, which is about a lifetime risk of 40%, and in BRCA2, a lifetime risk of about 18%, something like that. Uh, and we can argue with exactly what the numbers are, but the numbers aren't 100%. If you have a BRCA1 mutation, you have a 40% uh, lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. One way to interpret those data are that 60% of the women who have these mutations will not develop ovarian cancer. Yet, the clinical recommendation is that every woman who has a BRCA1 mutation should have her ovaries removed before menopause, sorry, before child, uh, age 35 or 40, or after childbearing is complete.